So as Scott said, this is on my nightstand, and I am Laura Cathcart Robbins. And today we're going to be reading from Raphael Augustine's amazing book, Illegally Yours, uh, a memoir. It's such a good book. It's so funny. Um, he's also one of our guests, so you've um, possibly already listened to his story. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about him. Um, Raphael Augustine was a writer on the award-winning CW show, Jane the Virgin. He is a Sundance fellow for his TV family comedy, Illegal, which is based on his life as a formerly undocumented American. He serves as CEO of the Latino Film Institute, where he oversees the Youth Cinema Project and other, like many other things, um, the Los Angeles Latino International Film Festival. Um, and there's, there's more about him here. That'll all be in the show notes. Uh, he is a really talented writer, funny guy, uh, great conversation we had with him. I'm so excited about it. So I hope you go back and listen to his episode if you haven't already listened to it. But um, where we are in the book, I'm actually right kind of in the middle of the book. The The thing is, is that Raphael was here. He believed himself to be uh, just like every other American boy. His family had come here from Ecuador to the U.S., and his parents have told him at this point in the book that he is actually undocumented. As much as I like to imagine myself as punk rock and counterculture, I was always a pretty straight-laced kid. I had a few run-ins with the law, but it was mostly teenage stuff. I would get upset if my dad drove over the speed limit or if my mom took too many samples at Costco. And she always took too many samples at Costco. Sure, I drank while underage, but it felt just like SoCal, a SoCal rite of passage. The early onset alcoholism did not take away from the fact that I was an honor roll high school student who also held down a full-time job. The news of being quote-unquote illegal was too much for me to digest. In times like this, I usually turn to episodes of Saved by the Bell for guidance. But in this instance, I didn't know what to do because there was no episode of Saved by the Bell where Zach gets deported. My parents and I didn't broach the subject of our immigration problems again. My dad and I were always good about not talking about the things that really bothered us. My dad would walk around the house like a silent assassin. If something bothered him, or if he knew something bothered someone else, he would go quiet and vanish from any interaction. And so we began ignoring each other. Outside of my dad, I also began alienating my friends. MJ and I drifted apart. Our relationship was a casualty of a lot of bitterness from the news I had just received and teenaged hormones run amok while undocumented. I stopped hanging out with her or anyone not inside my direct inner circle. I, of course, spoke to Napo and Sal about my predicament right away, or at least they forced it out of me. In the quad at school one morning, Napo and Sal noticed that I was uncharacteristically silent and asked me what was wrong. I didn't know what to say or if I should say anything at all. Would Napo and Sal judge me or think any differently of me if I told them my secret? They were my brothers, but would I be putting them in danger if I told them the truth of my legal status? After a moment, I finally fessed up that I had something important to tell them. Is it about Ross and Rachel breaking up? Because I'm still in shock, said Napo. I didn't know what they were talking about. That's how devastated I was by the news my parents had given me. I'd totally forgotten to tune in to the episode of Friends that began the, quote, we are on a break, unquote, era. Next time, give me a damn spoiler alert, Napo. I somberly said that it wasn't about Ross and Rachel. I took a deep breath and finally let it out. I have no papers. Sal looked around to make sure the coast was clear and then asked, like rolling papers? Because I can get you some. I laughed. Sal could always make me laugh, no matter how much I wanted to wallow in my own self-pity. I told the guys what my parents had shared with me. I told them that I was not legal. Hey, my uncles don't have papers and they're doing fine, Napo said nonchalantly. I had met some of Napo's uncles. They all had been in this country for over two decades. I didn't realize they didn't have papers. Somehow they managed to buy houses and drive nice cars, and more important, were able to provide for their families. Napo put his hand on my shoulder and made me feel like things were going to be okay. I looked up at Napo, who was much taller than me, 
and smiled. He made me feel normal again. Napo began working with his dad more. Post our day laborer for a day debacle, he had started, slowly started taking over the reins of his family business. And without telling his dad, he included our house in his route. In other words, Napo gave us free landscaping services. Ramon and his crew would come over once a week to tend our modest grass. I wondered if these workers didn't have documentation. I asked Napo about it, and he said, Nope, all these guys are good. So is my dad. Wow. It turned out that our gardeners were more legal than us. Our gardeners, by the way, that we were not paying for. My dad and I spoke less. We began to not understand each other at all. Unfortunately, we became a pale imitation of what we once were. Long gone were the elementary school days where we would try to play baseball together. I felt uncomfortable being home when he was around. I eventually asked Napo if I could move in with him. He loved the idea. He had, an, he had older siblings he hadn't really grown up with and wanted nothing more than to have a brother his age in the house. But he knew we had to run it by his parents first. One evening, Napo and I went to speak to his mom and dad, Rosario and Ramon. Ramon and Rosario were t- or a true immigrant success story. They loved each other dearly, built a large family together, created a small business from scratch, and happily grew old together. Like my parents, Ramon and Rosario always took in outsiders. Our homes were like revolving glass doors of uncles, aunts, cousins, friends, godparents, and perhaps a few co-workers. It was in their nature to say yes to my request. But Ramon surprised me when he said, no. Ramon clarified that they liked me very much and that they would help me out. In fact, his and Rosario's house would always be open to me. But I had a, I had a mom and dad, Ramon clarified. Any decision to move in first would have to be approved by your parents. Since I knew my dad wouldn't agree, Napo and I just left my request at that. As junior year came to an end, I started drinking more. I couldn't get a driver's license. I couldn't get a work permit. But I could get someone older than me to buy alcohol. I stayed out late longer. In my head, I thought I was sticking it to the man because what illegal immigrant wouldn't be out late drinking just to antagonize authorities? I came home late one night drunk to find my dad on the couch watching an action movie as usual. This was his nightly routine. He would watch movies until about 2 a.m. and would always be up when I got home. It was an awkward nightly interaction where we both avoided communication. This time when I walked in, my dad turned off the TV and got up from the couch. Without looking me in the eyes, he said, at least you know why I always wait up for you. He headed off to sleep while I stood drunk and undocumented by our front door.